morning. Thank you all for attending City and State's 2020 Bronx Virtual State Legislative Forum. I'm Zach Williams, State Government Reporter for City and State. We really got the Bronx here represented here today uh, after holding a couple of similar forums. Uh, I think that was my cat. Forums uh, uh, on Long Island. And you know we got a great group of state lawmakers and advocates here to talk about the Bronx and everything that is happening with all these important issues affecting seniors nursing homes, long-term care, prescription drug affordability, financial security. But before we get to the great discussion, I wanna thank our great sponsor, AARP New York, for helping us put on this event. So I'll give them a little bit of a clap in lieu of the in-person applause. We got Maggie Castro here to kick things off. She is Associate State Director of AARP. And in this role, she is responsible for community outreach, education, member engagement, local member experiences, federal, state, and local advocacy, organizing, and all Hispanic initiatives for AARP in New York, while serving as a volunteer coordinator for 300 volunteers. She's got a few things to say before we get started. So uh, let's kick things off, Maggie. Thank you, thank you, and good morning. Welcome to City and State's uh, Bronx State Legislative Forum sponsored by AARP New York. My name is Maggie Castro, and as mentioned, I'm the uh, AARP's Associate State Director of Outreach with a particular focus in the Bronx. I wanna thank all of you for joining us virtually today. So Zach uh, Williams from City and State will eventually uh, introduce our guests. Uh, these are your state legislators who represent you and your neighbors from the Bronx up in Albany. Zach will introduce each legislator, then launch right into questions. So. Uh, we carve out as much time as possible to hear their positions, plans, priorities on issues that are important to the 50 plus uh, population. Before we move on, I would like to emphasize that AARP is a nonpartisan organization. We do not contribute to political campaigns. We do not endorse political candidates. The purpose of today's forum is solely to educate our members and our participants on issues of importance so they are better informed. If we were gathered today in a big room the way we used to do, um, I would ask for a show of hands of how many of you have loved, have a loved one in a nursing home or how many of you possibly care for an older family member or a loved one at home or how many of those people or yourselves uh, take prescription medication. I imagine a lot of hands would be up. Nursing home conditions, family caregiving and prescription drug costs are leading issues for AARP and today will be asking our state legislators what they're doing or plan to do about those issues. I wanna thank our volunteers and our members from the Bronx who are in virtual attendance today. And I wanna note that they are key to what we do here. Um, that includes uh, in their red shirts up in Albany, making sure that our state legislators are aware and responsive to their needs. Um, I think our legislators can attest to that when they see the red shirts in the hallways. Our members will be listening carefully and are anxious as we wait to hear from our lawmakers. And with that, I wanna thank city and state for hosting this forum. And I wanna turn things back over to Zach. There we go, found my mute button. Thanks Maggie. Um, so wanna say thank you all again for coming and congrats to all of our panelists, at least those in elected office on your recent uh, elections. Had the pleasure to speak to many of you and interview a few of you. Um, so let's find out who we got right on here. Please just raise your hand, give a wave as I say your name. We got Luis Sepulveda, State Senator for the 32nd District. Jamal Bailey, State Senator for the 36th District. Jeffrey Dinowitz, Assembly Member for the 81st District. Uh, Gustavo Rivera, State Senator for the 33rd District. Natalia Fernandez, Assembly Member for the 80th District. Victor Pichardo, Assemblyman for the 86th District, Chantel Jackson, Assemblymember Elect, 79th District, Alessandra Biaggi, State Senator for the 34th District, and Karina S. Reyes, Assemblymember for the 87th District. And cleaning up is David McNally, Manager of Government Affairs and Advocacy for New York State AARP. So let's just jump right in. Feel free to drop questions into the chat section. We'll try to fit them in there, but we got a lot of stuff to cover. So going straight into it, you know, the, the pandemic's now 10 months in, we do see a vaccine on the horizon, but we're only little, little, un, little over one month away from budget season and everybody is really concerned about state budget cuts and how it might affect vulnerable populations like seniors, 
um, you know, so many things that they depend on transportation services, home delivered meals, you know, all sorts of social services to help people remain in their home. And the first question, hopefully to all of you is, you know, what will you do to help protect these programs from getting cuts? And what is one program that you think is particularly deserving of consideration? Let's hand it off to the State Senate uh, Health Committee Chair, Senator Rivera to start things off. Thank you so much, Zach. Thank you so much, City and State, ARP, and all of my colleagues. Great to see you virtually. Um, let's, let's start with the obvious. We need to raise taxes on millionaires and billionaires. That is something that I think everyone on the screen uh, who's a legislator has been calling for for months. We think it is irresponsible that the governor has been resisting this call for months now, while our folks have been asked us to, to sacrifice further. So we need to raise taxes on millionaires and billionaires to make sure that we can have more resources, more revenue to, to, uh, uh, to assuage the cuts that are gonna come to different programs. And as far as the program that I think is the most important, you kind of guessed it already, Medicaid. And again, I'll remind everyone, that during this budget crisis, dur during this pandemic, the governor has not only chosen to not raise taxes on millionaires and billionaires, but has chosen to cut Medicaid. So we need to make sure that we protect that so that we protect the most vulnerable in the entire state. So, you know, that's a really big issue, taxes. You know, many seniors rely on home and community-based funded programs through the state office for the aging specifically. Um, you know, uh, Assembly Member Reyes, you know, what is one particular program that you think needs to be protected to help seniors stay in their homes? Uh, hi, thank you for having us and thank you for City and State for hosting this. Um, scree and Dree programs are super important um, to help keep seniors in their home, um, particularly because it helps mitigate those uh, rent increases. Uh, I introduced legislation this year for automatic enrollment for Scree injury um, because many seniors uh, don't know that they qualify for that for that benefit um, and and don't apply so we want to make sure that we uh, continue that those programs but also that everybody has access to them um, and and automatic enrollment will be one of those ways to really help make sure that uh, seniors take advantage of, of that benefit so who can match an example like that who wants to jump in Well, I'll call on, oh, Assemblywoman uh, Fernandez. Thank you. Um, I think we need to support the programs like Meals on Wheels that bring food directly to our seniors. The pandemic has obviously kept people in their homes and seniors have depended on a lot of the food programs within community centers and, and more. So to have food that they need to survive brought directly to them has been a tremendous service. And I think we need to expand that further. Yeah, we also have to uh, continue to uh, provide more funding for these organizations that provide free food to our communities. Uh, as the Assemblywoman just indicated, food insecurity is one of the major uh, issues that we have, especially here in the Bronx. Uh, you know, we know that uh, even before the pandemic, the, the, the Bronx has always lagged behind on uh, economic standards, uh, job creation, and so forth. We still have about, although reports say we're about 21% unemployment, the reality is it's closer to 40%. And so one of the things that we have to do is to make sure uh, that we fund these kinds of programs, you know, be creative, like, uh, you know, urban gardens and things of that nature. Uh, because a lot of times yeah, the biggest issue is people deciding whether to have a meal or pay their rent or get their medication. Um, so we have to spend a lot of money as much as we can to make sure that we're able to provide food uh, for our seniors and just for our community in general. Just wanted to hop in and also add, sorry, <laughs> um, in the same vein as, as Senator Sepulveda and, and Assemblymember Fernandez, uh, the expansion of the SNAP program, I think would be important as well, um, because uh, SNAP has been considered the safety net under the safety net um, that many seniors rely on for, uh, for their food. Um, we've been working on legislation to uh, uh, enroll uh, New York State in the Federal Meals Restaurant Program so they can use their SNAP benefits to buy hot, healthy, prepared meals. Um, many of our seniors, uh, because uh, uh, of some disability, are unable to prepare their own meals. And we have individuals living in shelters who don't have access to cooking facilities um, and, and have to rely on like frozen, preserved foods. So if they are able to buy hot meals at restaurants and participating delis, that would be a great help for them as well. 
Transportation is a big issue for seniors as well. Uh, I'll, I'll hand it off to Senator Bailey. It looks like you had something to say about food, but I'd love to hear you all your thoughts on transportation as well. Well, well, well the food, like I think my colleagues have delivered that, that they've delivered, no pun intended, that, that point perfectly. <laughs> I want to talk about the social isolation perspective of what's, what our seniors are facing, right? So the reality is that senior centers are a lifeblood of our community. We have to make sure that we are continuing to fund them so that they can continue to provide the virtual um, gatherings that they're doing. Like, for example, um, not to mention people, but a young lady by the name of Sophia Reed, she runs one of the senior centers in my district. And she is very active in ensuring that seniors are continuing to stay connected. We have to make sure that we invest in order to make sure that all senior centers can so provide some sort of level of, whether it's that in-person food delivery or some sort of virtual Zumba class that they do or something to make sure that seniors continue to feel connected because social isolation is real for all of us but especially for those in their golden years who may not necessarily have the family member support around physically in the home, this support is clear and necessary now more than ever. And I just wanna add just in terms of revenue generating, because I know Gustavo mentioned uh, taxing, you know, the rich things like peer to tear tax, um, taxing the billionaires. Um, but one of the things that we seriously, seriously have to pass this year that can generate, they say it'll generate about $300 million uh, in tax revenue, that's legalization of recreational marijuana. Uh, it's, it's about time that we get this done. I know that they say only 300 million, but if you look at all the peripheral jobs that can come with that, um, this is an industry that can generate about a billion dollars for this state. And uh, we can use some of that money to continue to feed people in our communities. Uh, Zach, if I could, it's David McNally from AARP. First, I wanna thank everybody for uh, participating. This has been an incredible turnout. Uh, I don't think we've ever had so many legislators in one of our regional briefings. So thank you all so very, very much. Uh, and thank you for all the work you've done over the years to help uh, keep people in their homes by supporting those programs, primarily administered through SOFA and DIFTA, but they are so very important. You've mentioned a few of them, of course, Home Delivered Meals and SNAP and Senior Centers. And there are so many other programs that people rely on to stay in their homes and out of nursing homes. And that's what we really need to, even in the worst economic times, obviously priorities have to be set. And who could be a bigger priority than an older person who has paid into society, contributed their entire lives, and now all they want to do is stay safe and as independent as possible in their home. So we are, we're, we're really going to be fighting hard, even when there's little money or uh, less money to make sure that those people are put at the, at the very top of the list. So we thank you all for that. And I, in particular, I want to thank Assemblyman Dinowitz, who, who at one time was our aging chair, and we were knocking on his door all the time, and he was he was leading the fight in that house. And I would just want to call him out and thank him very much for his past support on these issues. Um, we are hearing devastating numbers. Um, uh, last two years ago, uh, you all agreed to put extra money in the budget to to um, there were waiting lists for all these important programs and there was money put in the budget, extra money to, to, to lessen those lists, make them smaller. Unfortunately, and it was working, unfortunately in the pandemic, we're hearing these lists are now exploding. We're hearing that there are 10, 11, 12,000 older New Yorkers waiting for just these types of services so they can stay home secure and independent. So I wanna thank you all very much for your efforts on these fronts and let you know that we will be fighting very hard to make sure as many older New Yorkers who can are allowed to stay in their home. Thanks, Zach. <laughs> now, well said. So, you know, a lot of seniors obviously live on fixed incomes. Another big issue during the pandemic has been utility shutoffs. You know, there have been moratoriums, but what do you think you know, I'll throw this to anybody who wants to jump in. You know, what do you think can be done to better protect seniors' access to, you know, electricity, gas, uh, water in some cases? I'll, I'll jump on that. First of all, everybody, good morning. Thank you again, city and state um, and uh, AARP for putting this together. Um, first of all, uh, I know I just want to take this opportunity as well to uh, congratulate and wish my colleague, Assemblymember Dinowitz, a happy birthday. Today's his birthday. Hey. Um, so uh, very quickly, I think we need to make sure that we fund and implement um, subsidies for seniors um, in terms of their utilities, but also work with our federal colleagues to make sure that the, the, the federal subsidies that are already available, um, you know, we're talking about the round of um, stimulus money that may be coming down the pike and there's some agreement 
happening in Washington, but that this agreement also includes those subsidies because when we shut down the power, some um, our seniors are dependent on this electricity and these utilities to stay alive. It's not just simply out of a sake of convenience or having a hot shower. It's literally running their oxygen tank, running their equipment that they need to live. So we need to make sure that we, that not only that we protect, that we fund, and we work with our colleagues on the federal level to protect these subsidies, to protect um, these uh, seniors and not have them lose access to the services that they deserve. You know, I, I'm very optimistic about the, the new administration in Washington, uh, certainly we're going to have a president and a vice president much more sensitive to the needs of people that, that uh, live in our community. And again, a lot of this is about funding. Uh, federal funding can, can cure a lot of these uh, problems that we're going to experience now, uh, in addition to us generating more tax revenue. But if the president um, is true to his word, then we're going to get a considerable amount of uh, stimulus money uh, into uh, New York State. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful uh, about that. But, you know, we also have to work with our utilities. Like I know Con Edison has a, an existing program where uh, if you have fallen behind on your utility bill, uh, they will allow you to enter into a payment plan. Uh, the difference uh, than their normal payment plan is that there's a caveat that allows you to sign up for a payment plan that doesn't require an initial down payment because sometimes the down payments are prohibitive. Um, so all these utilities should be put on notice that, uh, no one should lose their electricity or gas or any, any other utility uh, under these circumstances because they can't afford to pay their bill. Um, so that's something that we have to make sure that we super emphasize uh, to people, to uh, utilities like Con Edison and, and other ones that throughout the state. Uh, but let's keep praying that, uh, you know, we have changed administration, we have uh, normalcy, and we have someone who understands uh, the needs of the people in New York State, especially our county, which is one of the poorest counties in the entire country. One of the things that I've worked on uh, for a number of years, as, as AARP certainly knows, is the Utility Consumer Advocates Office bill, UCA. Uh, that's a bill which both houses have passed. Uh, the governor has vetoed it. Um, I'm hoping he will reconsider that poor choice that he made uh, with respect to that. But the Utility Consumer Advocates Office would save all consumers uh, huge amounts of money over time. It's worked in, I think, 46 or 47 other states. Billions of dollars have been saved in the, in the state of California, for example. And it's measures like that that impact seniors in particular. And, you know, all the programs that were mentioned uh, so far today, whether it's SCREE, talk about senior centers, Meals on Wheels, it's not that we want to pick one program over the other. We have to look at it at the overall picture. And the overall picture is that these programs taken together is what, what keeps seniors at home. It's not just Meals on Wheels, it's not just Scree, but we have, I guess over, I don't know, 50 years, uh, developed so many programs, and that's why seniors today are much, much better off than they were uh, back in the day. And we can't let any of those programs die. And that's why I think, uh, as Senator Rivera mentioned at the beginning, we have to, come up with revenue in order to protect every one of these programs. And that includes tax uh, hikes on the ultra wealthy and it includes significant aid from the federal government. I don't wanna leave out uh, the, the latest, newest member of the Bronx legislative delegation. And so member elect uh, Jackson, you know, what are your thoughts? I have a lot of thoughts, I'm grateful for uh, all of my colleagues that are here, and they've said almost everything I would have said. I, I actually get to live among seniors um, in a co-op in the Bronx, uh, where almost 70% of the residents are seniors. So I understand quite well how DRE and SCREE are, are absolutely necessary to keep seniors in their home, and how most of them still don't know. And with that amount of people, my seniors in uh, uh, Concourse Village, there's still not enough information, there's still not enough access to just the simple programs that we know already exist. So we, we already have things that exist. We just need to make sure that people have access and information regarding those things. And I'm actually, uh, William Hodson is the oldest uh, senior center and it happens to be in my district. Um, and so I understand how social isolation is affecting our seniors. They are suffering at home alone. So yes, we do wanna keep people at home, but we need to make sure that they have access to social engagement. And Zach, I just want to uh, shout out to all of the members who supported the moratorium extension. I want to thank all of you for, for, for getting that done. 
Uh, this is an issue that is of grave concern to us, of course, particularly as the as it gets darker earlier and people need more lights and it gets colder and people need more heat. And it's very, very important to us. So we want to thank all the legislators who, who supported the extension of the moratorium. We think everything needs to be on the table here. And so uh, I think it was uh, Senator Sepulveda mentioned uh, the Con Ed program. We think there are a lot of programs out there that we need to make sure people are aware of and that we're making it as easy as possible for them to access and sign up to with data matching, with automatic enrollments. So, so we're very, very concerned about this issue. We wanna make sure that the mor moratorium is, is working for people and they know how to use it, the law, and that they are signed up for programs that are currently existing. And frankly, we think the moratorium law probably is gonna to have to be extended and we'll be asking people to consider doing that. And we just wanna again, thank everybody for getting the moratorium extended in the first place. As part, as part of the access to these programs, one of the issues that I've had is, is language access. Um, many of the, I have a very diverse community. Uh, people in my community speak Bangla, they speak uh, French because uh, of the West African community. Um, and I've seen that many of the programs don't have multi-language information. Um, so one of the things that uh, we're pushing for and encouraging is to make sure that all these programs, all the flyers, all the information that, uh, that are available are available in multiple languages. I mean, you know, the Bronx has 50, 60 languages probably that people speak. Um, and so we have to make sure that we have these wonderful programs, if we're going to have them, that people know about them so they can get access to them. And, and that's an excellent point. I, if there's some way ARP can assist in that effort and promoting it or, or pushing a few uh, buttons to see if we can't get more of that done. We seem ready to assist that effort. Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of our disrupt disparities work we've been doing with the NAACP, the Oregon League, the Hispanic Federation, the Asian Federation. And uh, the utility issue is one that is, is right front and center. We see dramatic disparities about access to these programs and the availability of them and the and the problems people have in, in paying their utilities. So language barriers are certainly one of those issues we need to make sure is getting addressed and resolved as quickly and as 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 fully as possible. So thank you for that. If I may make a very quick point, something that I had forgotten earlier, but it's important to mention here is that as far as making sure that these programs can stay and continue to operate, and we're talking about programs and nonprofits that serve all sorts of folks, including seniors, we have federal money that currently the state has that the governor is insisting cannot be used to pay for services rendered that nonprofits have already that have already that have already done, and yet other states are already using that money. There's many of us in the state senate and assembly that have called for the governor to release this funding, which is coronavirus relief fund funding, that can be used to pay nonprofits who are currently, as we talked about earlier, the waiting lists on many of these services have skyrocketed because the needs of these vulnerable communities have skyrocketed so we make sure we need to make sure to keep these nonprofits alive we have the money and we have to use it before december 31st so we're calling on the governor to use that money because other states have used it he is insisting that he can't be used it can be used other states have done it we need to do it on behalf of these nonprofits yeah i, I think the governor is engaging in a strategy that, I, that i'm a little concerned about i know that he has talked about not negotiating against himself and waiting to see what kind of federal dollars come to New York State. And, and I think that's his, his reason or, or his, his excuse for not using those funds. But you know, with this uh, second uh, wave of coronavirus that's coming hitting us, I think it's a dangerous uh, strategy. And Gustavo, you're absolutely right. There's no reason why we cannot release those monies now. So language access, huge issue. But of course, uh, if somebody says something and they don't hear it, was it really ever said at all? Um, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm so scared that my broadband internet is going to freeze and I'm not going to know what's happening in this great discussion. Um, and I can't imagine what it's like for a vulnerable senior who, you know, doesn't have, you know, all the advantages that I have as a younger person. Um, you know, what internet access is so important. Um, you know, telehealth, we were talking about language ac accessibility issues. What can be done to make sure more seniors have access to good, reliable internet? Well, it's a it's a funding mechanism one, right? And it's also to make sure that I, that that our friends in uh, in in the private sector that they step up, right? They we we have we all have cell phones. We all uh, patronize number of wireless carriers or cable companies or or people that provide this type of access for us that we pay for. 
Um, look, if you are able to pay more, you should, right? We spoke about the taxation on those who are wealthy, but if you can't afford to pay more and you have, and, you know, and you have metaphorically paid so much to society as a senior and you can no longer financially afford to, this is the time for our friends in private industry to step up, for you to come to the table and join with us in state government and say, look, these are senior got these are seniors. These are places. How do we how do we retrofit or how do we how do we offer um, broadband and or, or Wi-Fi hotspots? How do we do that to make sure that that seniors have the access to their friends and their family? Because I know in Thanksgiving it was tough for us, right? It and so we couldn't we couldn't have everybody in the same home. So you're trying to have folks on Zoom. And now my family we're 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 blessed for the most part that we have younger folks who can kind of figure it out for them, either to connect them to, to, to the Zoom or to have the access to be able to do so. Everybody's not as lucky. And, that, and Zach, you, that, that goes back to that point of social isolation. They are disconnected from people physically. And if they don't have the internet, they're going to be disconnected from news, from media and from their family who is in a central lifeblood. So that's a two prong part thing. One, the money from the state, federal government, and also our friends in, in, in private industry, once again, you know, help, help us out a little bit. And, you know, you look at the, what's coming up with the future with uh, telemedicine. Uh, I think that one of the things this pandemic is, uh, has made us aware of is that we can use that uh, relatively an effective way to service people that, in our community. But, you know, obviously the, the cable companies, the Internet companies have got to step up and provide service. But if you don't have a, a, a computer or an iPad or something to get access uh, to the Internet, uh, then you can have all the broadband in the world. So we have to create a program that we did, although uh, like like the Department of Education, although their, their rollout wasn't great, uh, but we have to create a program where seniors that cannot afford a tablet, uh, a computer, uh, we're able to subsidize and get them one. Uh, you can work that through a lot uh, through the uh, senior centers, uh, you know, programs uh, that we have in our communities. But um, in, a, in a situation like this, where you have pandemic where seniors cannot get to the senior centers, then we should be able to provide them uh, with uh, tablets for free um, that have uh, language access uh, so they can use it for many things, including telemedicine, which I think it's the future. It's gonna have a big future now as, as uh, this pandemic is demonstrated. Has the time yeah, come I to make internet uh, an, an actual utility uh, like water, electricity, gas? Well, you know, the, if you look at, at uh, our cost for internet is ginormous as you compare it to other countries. Uh, you look at the Northern European countries where the cost of, of internet is about 90% cheaper mm. than what we have to pay here in the United States. And, you know, that's something that is just unforgivable. Uh, the internet should be as, as, as cheap as possible, uh, especially in poor communities. You know, there, there's no reason why children that are poor that are getting educated or seniors that live in poor communities don't have the same access uh, to wealthier communities. Uh, and so we have to really look into why our cost of internet is 90% more expensive than many European countries, many Eastern European countries, it just doesn't make sense. I'm gonna risk sounding a little radical and I actually think Wi-Fi should be free because when, when uh, in the inception of the internet, um, we made sure that the internet was free, right? That we weren't charging people to access information. And that should be the same case with Wi-Fi, particularly um, in the context of, of our reality right now where children are learning from home and it, we need telemedicine and we're working from home. Wi-Fi should be one of those things that we should have uh, a robust federal investment where we just make it available to everybody. And in terms of, of devices, I have to agree with the Senator. I, we saw that we saw the city roll out an air conditioning program in the summer where they started providing some seniors with air conditioners because they had to stay home. I believe that we can do the same with uh, uh, devices so seniors can have access um, to this what is right now a utility, it is a necessity to be able to, to connect with their doctors, with their families, um, and, and to kind of mitigate some of that social isolation. And Zach, if I may just jump in on this, part of why not having internet and having devices is such an issue is because at the very beginning of the pandemic, one of the things that myself and my team faced was how do we get information to a very vulnerable portion of the population that needs to understand whatever the new protocols are of the day and be able to communicate regularly. And so there really wasn't a good answer. And so we took many different measures, calling different seniors down a list, but also doing robocalls to make sure that we 
could also have wellness checks and, and to give them resources over that call. And it really is just not enough. So I think we've got to make sure that in times when it's not a crisis, we're actually being forward thinking and not just responding in real time because that's mainly why there are so many breakdowns when it comes to resources. Zach, could I jump in for a I second? I just want to acknowledge um, yeah. program. I just want to acknowledge uh, Block Power, who has been helping us in the Bronx get uh, internet access to our most vulnerable population. So I just want to shout them out. Um, and we need to push them and, and and other companies larger than them, like Verizon and others, to offer you know free Wi-Fi to our most vulnerable populations. High level just electricity need and power needs to be uh, protected because too many times just this summer, powers were going out uh, in my neighborhood and it's because wires were old. So there needs to be certainly uh, an infrastructure update in our power system just to make sure that power is not going out because it's too hot or because a little wind blew on it. David, what are you what are you hearing from the AARP's rank and file? Well, we're hearing a lot about this issue, as you can well imagine, particularly during the pandemic. I mean, social isolationism, uh, social isolation is, is is laid bare during COVID. I think a lot of a lot of places, and this is certainly one of them. Um, there is a bill on the governor's desk. I believe most everybody on this on this particular call voted for it. So I want to thank you for that. And it would require the PSC to do a study of where exactly is broadband or high-speed internet access available and where isn't it. Um, if, you ask, if you ask, they'll tell you 98 to 99% of the state is covered, but we can't find anybody other than the people who came up with that number to actually say they think that's true. Uh, I heard from over the last several months, I think 170 of our activists all over the state who said they, they didn't think they have access to uh, broadband or internet access. Um, We've actually been collecting quotes from elected officials about their about issues their constituents have been raising with them. And I've got to tell you, those comments are from elected officials at the city level, at the state level, all over the state. So this idea that we have this great high-speed internet coverage of 98 or 90% of the state, I just don't think is the fact. And we hope the governor will sign this bill. It's, uh, he's got what, three weeks left to do it, uh, to get the PSC to actually do a study of, of what's real and what isn't. I'd also say, again, going back to our disrupt disparities work, this issue, uh, we recently did a survey of the 35 plus statewide and uh, almost twice as many Hispanic cited cost as an issue of why they didn't have it as the general population. I mean, there's, and, and it was much higher among African-American blacks as well. So again, as we look at the disparities on, on across the board on these issues, this one certainly shows up as an issue that is so very important to everyone, particularly I think even the most skeptical people who weren't sure they would know how to operate something have, have realized in a crisis like this, everybody's gotta be online and have access and know what they're doing. And I'll also give a shout out to Oats, uh, the older adult technology services, they're ba based in the city. Uh, we, we work with them, of course, and they've been doing a lot of great work in, in doing just what their name sounds like, trying to get older people up to date on technology and, and, and get them comfortable in using it. But again, I just want to thank everyone for pass, uh, voting to pass that PSC bill and hope that the governor will sign it. If you're talking to him between now and December 31st, put in a good word for it. <laughs> yeah, and, and the notion that we have high speed uh, internet available throughout is ridiculous. I mean, look, when we're talking about another topic, when we're speaking about uh, uh, bail reform, uh, one of the arguments that uh, was problematic for us is that in, in suburban areas and up in northern countries, there are places that don't have any access, and there are a lot of seniors there as well. Um, so, you know, the proof is in the pudding, and obviously uh, what they're saying, I, you know, I'd like to see that report, but I don't see 90-something percent uh, of the state having access to high-speed internet. Yeah, exactly. We've heard even that, that, that same point. That same point that we when we just when we discussed about the uh, about the the devices that are necessary in terms of that implementing that reform. There are places further north that that simply don't have that are nowhere near 97, 98 percent. And and if you talk to to the legislators, and we've grown our representation upstate, so we'll have more of a voice in that in the New York State Senate this coming year. And and, and you'll be able to hear, uh, specifically speaking, that this is a, this just doesn't happen. So. I voted for the study and I'm all for it. Sorry to cut whoever yeah. was, you know, if I apologize. 
Well, thank you, Senator, and we appreciate your support for the study. I think it, I think there was one negative vote between the two houses on it. So uh, huge support for it. We can just get the governor to do it. Um, it is a it is a problem that we and somebody's got to come up with the right answers. And and often people think of this as a rural issue. We actually had a, a New York City Council member tell us that uh, she had a constituent saying that uh, they kept being told they had high speed internet access and in fact she didn't and she had to go to great lengths to prove that in that building <laughs> there was not in fact high speed internet access even though the map said the area did have it so this is an issue all over the place and one that absolutely has to be addressed and we appreciate everyone's support for for, for it certainly a huge issue in the bronx um it's unforgivable but it's a huge issue here um just like many other social issues that uh, are problematic here, but uh, you know, uh, high-speed internet, internet available to our poor communities is, is a vital necessity, and it's shameful that we don't have that available to all of them. You, I, I don't think there's any issue that's galvanized people statewide, nationwide more than the nursing homes during the pandemic. Um, obviously, a heavy death toll, uh, many lessons learned. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask what we should do next to protect seniors uh, in the second wave than to take advantage of the one healthcare worker we got right here on the panel, Assembly Member uh, Reyes, who I think uh, might have some uh, thoughts on this issue. Yeah, um, so the thing, the thing that's so complicated about nursing homes is that there are different kinds, right? There are some that are, are um, city run and some that are privately run. Um, some that are unionized and some that aren't. And because those standards differ uh, across the gamut on uh, what nursing home you're staying in, then the, the quality of care differs as well. And I think that's something that we need to address. But furthermore, we also have to address um, the reimbursement rate, how they are able to, to um, uh, get money from Medicaid or from insurance companies and how that money is distributed in terms of how they provide care, whether it be for staffing, whether, um, it be uh, the quality of the infrastructure of the building, um, how they disperse medication, all those issues, I think, um, uh, create disparities because there is no standard. Um, and we need to start working on that. Um, and, and I think in, in the same vein as, as David was mentioning earlier, I think we need to focus on keeping seniors at home primarily um, and doing the best that we can to, to um, um, uplift those services and, and, and uh, prop up those services that help keep seniors at home, whether it be uh, expanding home care, um, perhaps uh, uh, physical therapy at home, um, so that we can keep more seniors at home and less of them in, in nursing facilities. And then, and then also, we also have to address the, the quality of care and, and the workers that are providing home care. Uh, we've had issues where many agencies, as well as nursing homes, some of them are private, um, are, are keeping their workers uh, working 24 hours, which of course is, is unsafe. Um, so I think we need to consider all those issues and, and uh, unfortunately the problem is very nuanced and very complex, um, but we need to kind of address all these things simultaneously. I, I think it's important to also underscore the fact that as we approach the second wave and we've been hearing in the news and through our own legislative briefings regarding the development of the vaccines um, for COVID that I understand that there's about 170,000 that should be coming in um, at some point this month, that these vaccines actually go uh, first to first responders like uh, my colleague Assemblywoman Reyes and, and our nurses and doctors, but also that we make sure that we make an effort to uh, get those vaccinations to the most vulnerable among us, which is our seniors. Um, they should be protected first. They've done um, what they've done a lot for our society. So we need to make sure as a society that we pay that uh, back uh, a hundredfold. Um, but more importantly, that we do it in a way that's accessible for them, that it's not um, breaking the bank for them, that it's free, that it's accessible for them, um, and that they get there first, that it shouldn't be because of you know, this person has a connection with this person, they get the vaccine, but rather who needs it first? Who are the most vulnerable populations that need this, this vaccine and this medication um, and that they get it first, uh, regardless of income, regardless of where they live. And, and you know, myself and many of my colleagues Evan, are, are gonna make sure that that happens, um, not only in the first wave, but the second wave, the third wave, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
you know, and, and to take that one step further, Victor, let's look at the communities that were most impacted from the uh, COVID uh, in terms of death rates and infections. In the Bronx, uh, I believe it was 34% of Latinos, 29% of African Americans. Um, so I certainly agree that the, the first uh, vaccination should go amongst our essential healthcare workers who put their lives on the line, uh, lives on the line every single day. Um, that it should first come after them should first come to communities like ours. Um, our seniors, our communities, our populations were impacted in terrible ways. And I think it'd be unconscionable that after the first individuals, the essential workers, our doctors, our nurses, of course, I'm sure Karinez agrees with me with that on that, um, they should be vaccinated, but then that those vaccines should come to the Bronx uh, and to other poor areas uh, throughout the city of New York. But here, uh, as the governor said, he agreed that we should bring it to these kinds of communities, uh, including the undocumented community, uh, but we suffered the most and we should be first in line after our essential workers. I think it's already been established that the first batch of vaccines are going to go to uh, healthcare workers and to people living in facilities such as nursing homes. And then there's going to be uh, presumably older people will get it next and so on. I think a bigger problem that we have are the people who don't want to get vaccinated. I will refrain from using the type of language I'd like to use to describe some of the people who oppose vaccinations uh, in a situation like this. But the fact is, if people don't get vaccinated, they're not only endangering themselves, but more importantly, they are going to be endangering other people because they're more subject to uh, catching the virus, of course. So we have to engage in a major, I guess, education campaign to convince people that they should get vaccinated. And there are also a lot of skeptical people um, in some of the communities such as in the Bronx because of past history. So I don't blame some people uh, for being concerned about this, but there are also sort of professional activists who oppose vaccinations and they are going to be endangering people's lives. So we have to do everything we can to convince as many people as possible to take the vaccinations in the first place. We, we talked have about to agree. Before, uh, Assemblymember Reyes, uh, you know, tell me uh, how better uh, can we reach out to communities? Uh, well, I just wanted to comment on what, on what uh, uh, Assemblyman Dinowitz said. I have to agree. We are in also in a pandemic of misinformation. Um, and unfortunately, our seniors are, are uh, especially vulnerable to that. Um, because of um, their in, they, they don't have the skills sometimes to discern what is actual legitimate factual information that their uh, um, uh, content that they see on the internet and what is um, propaganda. And a lot of this propaganda has fueled all this misinformation and this mistrust in the healthcare community, uh, particularly around COVID. Um, and, and what the vaccine uh, will do. Uh, and I, I mean, I, some of the craziness I've heard is extremely troubling. Um, and, and if you look back at every other uh, instance where we had healthcare crisis, we look at polio, uh, measles, when people were getting vaccinated, it was that that helped keep so many people safe and safe and save so many lives. And I just wish that people would kind of go back in history and see how uh, vaccines have really helped the population. Um, and and uh, go about it in that in that way, but um, uh, it's going to be it's going to be a challenge, and I think it's going to be up to us and institutions like AARP to kind of start dispelling those myths um, uh, around vaccination. So we're, yeah. we're, we're trying to run a, a little bit short on time. There's there's one other topic that I really want to get to before mm -hmm. we take a few uh, audience questions: prescription drugs. Uh, we've talking a lot about how much uh, seniors struggle to afford all these different things that they need to survive. What can we do with prescription drugs? So I have a bill that, that, that passed the Senate unanimously. It was about the EPIC program, which is a phenomenal program. And it's about eligibility for the EPIC program. Um, you shouldn't be punished, right? And right now, if you are a senior and, and you happen to be blessed and you're in, in by an increase in the cost of living, or an increase in a pension or something like that, where, where you, you age out of the 25, you price out of the 25 or 50,000, you can lose your EPIC eligibility, which especially now was something that we cannot afford. So it, it, it passed the Senate unanimously last year and, and, I'm, and I'm going to reintroduce it again, this, uh, this upcoming session so that we can um, like continue to protect our seniors and maintain their eligibility in that EPIC program because it certainly, it certainly works wonders. Um, and 
I think that that's one of the things that we can do. And I know my colleagues, I don't want to take up too much more time considering we're running short, but I know my colleagues have great ideas in that space as well. And Senator exactly. Bailey, like we want to just thank about. you for that bill. We were strong supporters of it. We we're going to be supporting and pushing again, and hopefully it gets passed in both houses. Uh, so thank you for that. Zach, I'd like to just jump in and talk a little bit about the pay to delay deals, um, which was my, one of my key priorities in the last uh, legislative session, it will continue to be. Um, and so for those of us who don't know what that is, um, I was very shocked to learn when I, when I did. Pay to delay deals essentially are these agreements that brand name prescription drug companies use to incentivize generic companies and manufacturers to delay any type of available and more affordable alternatives, um, which is frankly criminal in my opinion. And so I've been working very closely with the AARP in New York. Um, very much a shout out to Bill Ferris. Thank you for all of your help and support on that issue. Um, right now, patients in New York and around the country, we know this, we, we hear about this almost all the time. They're facing these exorbitant prices um, and costs, and also frankly, lack of transparency on how medication is even priced. It's a priority, I think, for many of us here. Um, and so the legislation that I currently sponsor is called the Manufacturer Disclosure and Transparency Act. Um, although we, I think we'd like to take it one step further and frankly, just ban um, these agreements all together. And that would make a very big difference in the lives of every single senior, not just in the Bronx, but across the entire state. And Senator Biagi, we're right there with you, as you know. Uh, thank you for your leadership on the pay to delay. We made it a hallmark of our own Stop the Greed campaign, Stop Rx Greed campaign, and we'll continue to do it uh, next year. We're, we're delighted to hear of your interest in actually outright banning it. And I know you've been working, your office has been working closely with Bill Ferris, and we just really can't thank you enough for your leadership on the, on the prescription drug issues. Thank you. Thank you. And, and two, on two, two quick things on prescription drugs. Uh, first of all, there's a bill that currently sits unsigned on the governor's desk. Well, it's not technically on the governor's desk yet, uh, uh, which was uh, put together by activists, by my office and the act activists for Insulin for All, which would actually create an assistance, uh, a drug assistance demonstration program to make sure that people have access to insulin. This is a life-sustaining medicine. We need to make sure that people have access to it and many folks can't afford it. So this will create a, a pilot program to make sure that, that they can. Uh, and there's also, a, a, a very quickly, there is something called the third 340B program. That is a federal program that gives an ability to certain healthcare facilities, uh, uh, federally qualified health centers, et cetera, gives them discount on drug prices. And they use those savings to be able to provide services for the most vulnerable who they serve. Uh, and right now, because uh, there's, a, there's a change that the governor wants to impose, there's a bill that I've introduced with Assemblymember Gottfried in the assembly to delay this change. The state is claiming savings for themselves, but this would take away money from healthcare centers, federally qualified health centers, and folks who help folks with HIV positive status, et cetera, who are the most vulnerable around the state, who are served by this money, these entities would not be able to have access to that money anymore. So those are two things that I think need to be done. Number one, to sign the bill to provide, uh, to secure, uh, to, we need to do much more on access to insulin, but this would go towards a long way towards providing that access. And second, to secure the continuing uh, program, 340, 340B, which is a federal program, but to not change the way that it is structured here so that these facilities could continue to get access to this funding and be able to provide these services to the most vulnerable. We got, we got a question from the audience that I think riffs really well on something we've been talking the whole time. We've been talking about so many seniors that are stuck at home and how we can make it more comfortable and safe for them. But what can we do to get seniors out more, uh, even during the pandemic? Um, you know, when it, whether it's open streets or improving access to the subway system or anything else, what do you think we can do to better accommodate seniors in public spaces, even during the pandemic? You know, a lot of that can fall on, on the shoulders of the assistance of our senior centers that do a wonderful job. Look, I have a uh, Rain Senior Center in my district and they do fantastic work with our seniors. They can, you know, they have access, they have their phone numbers, they have relationships with them. Um, and I think organizations like RAIN and, and other senior centers um, can take the lead on this and help us devise programs where they can go out and, and see their friends, maintain social distance. But the, the anchor of this has to be our senior centers.
Any other thoughts from anyone on kind of promoting uh, active lifestyles uh, per this audience question? Well, I think, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Assembly Member Fernandez, please, um, I defer to you. Senator Sapula, that our senior centers, um, their programming and the ideas and initiatives that they've been putting out have been great. And, you know, a little more can always do wonders. Um, now that it's cold, I don't know how much seniors want to come outside, but the virtual and, and telecommunication, you know, by phone can be something. Uh, but walking tours is something that I've seen started by seniors in my district. You know, we got a lot of parks in my district. So uh, taking a tour down your, your local park, the local um, business corridor sometimes can be the highlight of the day. Um, Zach, if I may add, I mean, expanding bike lanes is also another way to think about this. Um, and then talking a little bit about home health care and making sure that we're continuing to invest. I mean, similar to how we have really in many different, many decades across uh, the state's history and recent history, we have divested from hospitals. And we've also divested from and underfunded the home healthcare industry. And that's unfortunate because for many seniors, this is one of the most affordable ways to be able to stay in their homes and also to have a companion and a person who's consistently showing up in their home. It goes to a lot of the things that we've heard Senator Bailey talk about when it comes to social isolation. They're not alone. They have someone that they can talk to and do different um, activities with, but also for many seniors, that's something that they're probably relying on to be able to even leave their home. And so we have to I think have different alternatives and different ways of addressing this issue, but those two definitely are at the top of my list. And, and very quickly, I just wanted to jump in and again, thank my colleagues for this. I think since World War II, um, the city and the state has disinvested from green spaces, particularly in urban areas across the state. And it's more particularly seen in, um, in the Bronx and Brooklyn. Uh, we need to reinvest into our green spaces, community gardens, uh, local parks, um, having good facilities, maintained facilities, because as you know, during World War II, after World War II, I mean, as uh, certain populations moved to the suburbs and to other parts of the state, um, there was less of an incentive for the local municipalities and state government to invest into local city parks and that kind of stuff. So we really need to um, re-up and reinvest into these in these green spaces, which our seniors always take advantage of, especially when the weather's nice. So I agree. Um, one reason. last quick thing. We're, we're running out of time, but maybe uh, Senator Bailey wants to handle this one just for fun. We got almost one tenth of the legislative supermajorities right here on one Zoom. <laughs> uh, you guys have all mentioned a lot of big ideas, but some of them, you know, don't get vetoed by the governor. This year could be a little bit different, but uh, let's get somebody in trouble here. You know, what is the legislature going to do to more to assert itself a little bit? I'm going to be diplomatic, assert itself a little bit more uh, strongly against the governor who doesn't always share your priorities on senior issues. Nobody wins when the family feuds, to, to, to quote Jay-Z, right? So we got to be together on this one. We got to have uh, our conferences together and we have to have our, the houses together to make sure that we, that we are figuring it out, that we're going to stand strong and we're going to make sure we get things done, especially for our seniors. Um, I just want to, I wanted to point out one thing about a program that AG James does. It's called Smart Seniors. It's a phenomenal program that, 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 um, that kind of like stops seniors from getting involved in a lot, a lot of these phishing scams. And I think that's critically important to be able to disseminate that information, especially around the holiday situation, the season where, where the scammers are trying to take advantage of people who, are, who have done hard work for us to make sure that, that we're staying vigilant. But to your original point, we got to stay unified and we got to continue to push that agenda, push that envelope. Yeah, and we also have, you know, in the Senate with our majority, uh, we are very close uh, in terms of our philosophies. Most of the members uh, in, in the conference are very close in philosophy, but, uh, you know, we, we certainly, uh, we take our, our um, uh, from the leadership, from Andrea Stewart-Cousins, um, she has done a fantastic job of getting us a super majority, um, but we, uh, to a large extent, uh, we work with her, she works with us to make sure that uh, we were able to assert ourselves when we think the governor is not doing enough. And uh, she has done that in a great, in a great way. Um, she has played the long game. Um, she has defied expectations. Uh, but we have to give a lot of credit to, uh, to Senator Stewart Cousins and uh, allow her to be the leader. Um, and I'm sure that we'll accomplish a lot of the things that perhaps the governor is unwilling to do. 
So on that no, note, governor, uh, Zach, uh, Zach, excuse me. Can oh. I just have 15 seconds? I know we're running out of time. Of course. I, I didn't want to interrupt the conversation of the elected officials on nursing homes because that's why people are here to hear from you, not from me. But I, I can't let this end without calling out Senator Rivera for his leadership on trying to get the right information during those hearings about how many people have died not just in nursing homes, but in the hospital, but they were from a nursing home. And I, I just want to thank you for your leadership on this issue. We've got to have the right data so we can be making the right decisions. And we need to know how many people have died in the nursing home or that were in the nursing home, but died in the hospital. And I just want to thank you for the, your leadership on that hearing. And I also want to thank and everybody. Bill on that. And I have a bill on it. Just and case. we thank you for that. And we're strong supporters of it. And I want to thank everybody. Also, one of the COVID bills that passed during the COVID session was emergency plans for nursing homes. And we got to make sure those emergency plans are actually being held uh, done and that the facilities are being held accountable to do them. So I, I just, uh, I don't want to take up any more time, but I just thought I, I, I want to make sure I got that in there. So thank you. <laughs> Well, uh, well appreciated thoughts. Hopefully, David, you didn't steal the thunder from Maggie because she was the one that threw down the gauntlet at the beginning of this uh, conversation. I was hoping you could just offer a few closing thoughts on what we can all do to uh, help seniors moving forward. That's all right, Zach. We work in tandem and we work in partnership. <laughs> really grateful to all of you for um, for joining us and you know our, our state and legislators for attending this, for joining us, for answering so many questions that came in. Thank you, Zach and City and State for moderating today's uh, forum. It, we're very grateful for that. And we also wanna give a special thanks and, and a special shout out to our Bronx residents for joining us. Um, hopefully you all found this conversation informative and useful. I know I did. Um, we're all, you know, we're all treading these uncharted waters. The decisions that our elected officials make and the policies they enact are sure to have a far reaching effect and during the remainder of this pandemic and after, thereafter. So. I hope that each of you feels better equipped and better informed to make those decisions, to take your own actions, which will certainly inform the impact and the decisions that are taken by our elected representatives. So for those of you attendees who are interested in working more closely with AARP and getting more involved with the work that we do, please feel free to give us a call at 866-227-7442, or you can send us an email at uh, nyaarp at aarp.org. I wanna thank everyone. Uh, for joining us and hope you have a really great day. So we just got two minutes left. Uh, you know, the Boogie Down Bronx really, really represented today. It's going to be a tough act to follow, <laughs> but we have plenty of city and state events still coming up where we can uh, dive into great state policy uh, discussions. This includes our December 8th virtual transportation in New York Summit must see. And in December 14th, we're keeping the conversation going on senior issues with the Queens Virtual State Legislative uh, Forum. That's December 14th. And we also got another one on how seniors in Central and Western New York are being affected on December 10th. And, and so Zach, thank you all. I, I, excuse me, Zach, I'm sorry. I, oh. I can't, we can't, I can't see 200 Bronx ARP members on the phone or watching this without shouting out this the following phone number in case they want to call the governor about the broadband bill. Uh oh. It's eight it's eight four four two five four six eight eight three. So call the governor, tell him to sign that bill so we know where this is going on. It's eight four four two five four six eight eight three. And I want to just join Maggie in thanking everybody. Um, we are a, the largest membership organization of the 50 plus we have 750,000 members in New York, and we just can't thank you all enough for the time you spent with us today. Well, applause for all for members of our panel. The AARP is certainly a force to be reckoned with, and thank you all for attending this great event. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>